also some different tips and strategies that will play out specifically for their area, but also that we hope will translate into the home health setting. So we thank you for joining us for this. Want to remind you that currently all the lines are muted, and we will continue that until we get to the Q&A portion, but we want to encourage you as you have questions, start sending them in through the Q&A section on your computer screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but remember, as always, if we're unable to get to all the questions, we will get those answered and posted for you at a, throughout the month of December and a little part, bit into January. So with us on the HHQI team, we have the RN project coordinators, Crystal Welch, Misty Kevich, and for those of you I haven't met, my name is Cindy Sun. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and let's turn everything over to Crystal Welch. Crystal? Well, thank you, Cindy, and th good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just keep my announcements very brief, but just a few ca campaign announcements. I'll start off by uh, letting everyone know that the HHQI campaign currently stands at, uh, the participation currently stands at 14,433 participants from 5,430 agencies. So we're very happy to see that number increase every um, month, and I uh, just wanted to make that quick we are also very pleased to honor our uh, Agency of the Month, uh, which is University Home Health out of Augusta and Martinez, Georgia. Uh, they were randomly selected among our home health agencies that are in the top percentile of performance in a, um, acute care hospitalizations or in oral medication management. So we're very pleased to be honoring them throughout the month of December, both on our campaign website, and they were featured in our Inside Edition HHQI newsletter, e-newsletter this month. And uh, so just congratulations to the entire team for their dedications to, uh, dedication to excellence. Um, and if you <clears throat> also want to be in the spotlight, if your um, home health agency is active in the campaign um, and close to the national risk-adjusted ACH 20th percentile in, um, or the oral medication management in the 80th percentile or better, uh, your agency is eligible for random selections, so nominate your agency today. Uh, just uh, Misty Kevich, a real quick announcement that she's going to be back um, at in a few minutes just to let us know about a new QAPI course coming to HHQI University. Uh, QAPI is our Quality Assurance and Performance Improvement. Uh, if you are not familiar with QAPI, uh, but this will be released on January 2nd, and she will be by to tell us a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, just a quick reminder that the new quarterly event schedules are the third Thursday events such as today with our Cardio Lamb. Uh, just a reminder that our um, primary networking events are live chat, Cardio Lamb, and our underserved population webinars. So if there's a third Thursday going on, uh, more than likely something's going on with HHQI. So just keep that uh, and top of the mind awareness for third Thursdays. And remember, uh, there's uh, something more likely going on on third Thursday. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. Uh, lastly, Cindy, I just wanted to mention, just to remind folks um, that following us on social media is a really good way to get important information. Uh, so when it happens, uh, you know, we try to post things as soon as it happens before it's old news. So make sure just to connect uh, with HHQ on social media just for some valuable information and, of course, those free resources related to health observances and, and campaign updates, industry news, and things like that. So with that, Cindy, I'm going to go ahead and turn it right back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Crystal. And for everybody who joins these calls, you're familiar with Stacey Deslick, who is our health data analyst. She had a schedule conflict with today. So I'm going to be channeling my inner Stacey and give the HHDDR update. So as you know, Stacey always lets us know what is the most abstracted and the most episodes abstracted. So currently, for those who are in the Home Health Cardiovascular Data Registry, the most agencies are abstracting hypertension, but the most episodes abstracted are focusing on tobacco. So that's kudos to all of you because those are the two topic areas that do impact the patient's overall health more than anything else. Now, Stacey also noted that recently there's been a surge in the number of agencies abstracting cholesterol measures. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, performance rates are holding steady or they're improving, as is in the case of the cholesterol measure. So nice job, very nice job. 
So the challenge, as you know, Stacey always gives the challenge. Her challenge for this session was really just to maintain what you're currently doing. Because of the holidays, we know that everything's getting a little hectic and quality can tend to go down or be put on the back burner during the holiday season. So we want to encourage everybody to keep doing what you're doing, maintain, sustain, and don't let it fall through. That's the whole challenge for this month. Now the big news in the registry, and this just happened yesterday, so this you are the first group who's going to hear about this. For those of you that have been abstracting hypertension, you're aware that there are two different measures. There's the measure 236A, which is looking at hypertension, the blood pressure control. That's the question asking what was the final blood pressure in the record. There is 236B, which is asking about the follow-up plan for patients with hypertension. This will probably be very good news to most of you who are familiar with this. The 236B hypertension follow-up plan is going to be eliminated from the registry. We don't have a date. Like I said, this just was finalized yesterday. We'll keep you updated, and you'll know when you open it up. But we have heard you. We've heard your concerns over this. We understand that this is a very tough, broad data definition. It is a good measure for physicians' offices because physicians' offices, everyone who sees the patient is an MD or an MD designee. But one of the issues here is because of the breadth of and the, the amount of scopes of practice that go into play in taking care of a patient with hypertension, that this measure was really becoming not, it was producing bad data for you. So we decided um, with CMS approval that it would be better to remove this one from the registry. And from those of you that I've heard from personally, you're welcome. <laughs> we know that you wanted it out of there. So um, hopefully that will be soon, but it'll definitely be before the um, middle of spring. So that's the information that we had on the registry. And now I'm going to turn it over to Misty Kavich for educational announcements. Misty? Thanks so much, Cindy. Um, at beginning the new year, we're going to be uh, releasing four uh, new courses in HHQI University with some really good resources. And it's called the Home Health Quapi Course Series. And as you have been abstracting, you're gathering all this data, looking at your reports, trying to identify problems. Well, what we're doing is creating a way and a mechanism with tools and resources to go ahead and create a performance improvement uh, project or a plan. Uh, with the draft COPs that came out last October, pending final approval, but this language is very consistent with what else is be, what is being used in hospice and even in the hospitals, hospitals. We know that that's going to be fairly accurate. We have created QAPI 101. It talks about what the five standards are of QAPI. It provides some tools and resources to looking at the design of a QAPI program within your organization. If you haven't done one, for um, a certification before. But one of the five standards is performance improvement projects. And that's how you can leverage the cardiovascular data registry that you're doing. All the work that you're doing with abstracting, looking at the reports, we're going to show you how you can put that into a performance improvement plan and be able to get credit for that for your agency and be able to make true quality improvement for patients. So we will have the uh, QAPI 101, that will be a mandatory course first as a course. And then after you've taken that, you have a choice of three different um, sub-courses. The one is cardiovascular health, and that's the perfect course for you. It will show you and provide you tools and resources of trying to identify your problem using the data and then going ahead and picking out uh, intervention strategies and tools and resources that are all hyperlinked within um, a tool for you. So and you will also have access to a hospitalization one and a med management. So look for that. They each come with 1.5 hours of CEs for each of those courses. So January 4th. And that's it, Cindy. Well, thank you, Ms. D, and thanks, everybody. So let's get what we're all here to talk about today, and let's talk about the Inspira 
Health Network Transition of Care Coaching Program Team. Let's turn it over to Pat Heslop and her team. Pat? Hello, everyone. This is Patricia Heslop. I am the Care Coordination APM Coach Liaison. Um, unfortunately, our Administrative Director, Lynette Newkirk, will not be with us today. Um, I have here with me today four of our coaches, and they'll be introducing themselves as we go along. I just wanted to share with you some information about our program that we um, have been using to work with our community to prevent readmissions. Um, it's a transition of care program, and we have the acronym COACH program, which actually means collaborating options across the continuum of health care. Our team, our, our team members are, as listed there, Sharon, Sharon uh, Bauschich, Gail Raquel, Terrica, Gavin Aero, Tammy DeSerio, Pat Heslop, Michelle Santos, and um, Latoya Yeoman, and of course our um, director, Lynette, who as I said before, did not make it today. Um, the program itself, I'd like to give you an overview. That's our team. I'd just like to give you an overview of um, the program itself. Our main goal is to facilitate safe, safe transition of care for patients from hospital to home and to reduce rehospitalization for patients um, with specific disease processes. We like to empower them to be accountable and really to participate in their care. And um, this was um, implemented as a result of the 2012 CMS um, readmission um, the reduction program and um, hospitals were receiving penalties based on their readmission numbers. Um, so, the program is um, a transition of care program. It um, addresses um, patients with high risk for readmission. We um, focus on certain disease processes, heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, MI, and stage renal failure and diabetes. And we manage to screen our program by using a tool called the LACE tool and um, patient with a score of 11 or more on the lay school are usually considered as appropriate candidates and are approached for enrollment. Um, once we have enrolled our patient in the hospital setting, we try to make a home care visit um, 24 to 48 hours after discharge. Um, patients with heart failure, we usually try to do two visits in a month, but other patients it's basically just one visit, um, and other visits are scheduled if, I, if the need is identified. After the visits, we do follow phone calls 10 to 12 days and 30 days after discharge. And as I would mentioned before, our main focus was really to look at the 30-day um, readmission. Um, the rest of our program focuses on um, education. We provide it education. We use the teach back method we, um, for all the different disease processes. And we also give education on available community resources because some of our patients were not aware of some of the um, resources that are available. We are in the Cumberland County area and um, our social and economic needs are um, kind of somewhat depressed. We do reconciliation of uh, medication. We also assist with um, post-discharge services such as scale care, subacute. We provide scales. Some patients are identified and not being able to provide themselves with food. We have food packages, glucose meters, pill boxes, and we manage to um, work with them on setting up post-discharge appointment, which for patients like heart failure requires a, a visit to their PCP within seven days of discharge to prevent readmission. 
Um, of course, we review the steps to follow if those patients um, need to see their has developed um, any um, conditions that require immediate medical attention. Um, just to give you a timeline of how our program was implemented, in 2010, um, our direct, the care coordination director and myself um, came up with a proposal on how to reduce readmission. We looked at the evidence-based practice model of Red and Boost and um, we made a proposal to senior management um, and um, it was accepted. We collaborated with some of the case managers and um, other disciplines, PI, safety, and so on. And we decided to start a pilot program which was started in August of 2010. It was focused on just one care, one care center, acute care, and it was very successful. Um, we used one FTE from our case management um, department and a 0.5 from our home care agency for the home visit. After that, our program gradually expanded um, to the point where we included other disease processes such as dialysis, um, diabetes, and um, of course, we included our food program, our scale and glucose program. In 2014, we um, looked at including a respiratory therapist for COPD, and one was implemented in our Vineland campus at the end of 2014, and another in our Woodbury campus in 2015, beginning of 2015. Um, since that time, we have managed to um, expand our FTEs to four RNs and two respiratory um, therapists. Moving forward in 2015, we do use, have eight hour days with a RN on visit. But moving forward for 2016, we're hoping to follow a disease-specific model. We still will have four RNs and two respiratory therapists, but we are also um, about to include um, visits, home visits with the paramedics out of our Woodbury campus. And that should be um, effective, fully effective in 2016. Um, I would now like to turn you over to one of our coach or respiratory therapist. She will be talking a little bit of some of her experience with our patients. Hello. Sharon. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, my name uh, is Sharon Bossage. I am a respiratory therapist. I've worked for Inspira for 23 years and have been in case management as um, the COPD coach for the Vineland campus since September of 2014. Um, we track data, uh, um, obviously that's how all this is driven, but um, it becomes a very personal thing when you're uh, so involved with these patients and doing so much follow-up with them. Um, so the individual stories uh, to me matter as much as um, all, the, all the data that's tracked. And um, so when we were doing, putting this presentation together, um, there was many, many, many patients that could have been put in here as a good example of how the program works on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this was one of my first patients. Um, I actually met with patient KT and um, I started the program in September, so this was November of 2014. Um, he came in, um, it was his first hospitalization for COPD. He was a three-pack-a-day smoker. Um, he actually rolled his own cigarettes at home, so he did not even have the incentive financially to quit. Um, we had a lot of bedside education, a lot of discussions. Um, I you know, told him he's relatively young to be this ill. And um, he was very receptive. Um, I don't think he really processed everything. Uh, he was discharged. We, you know, he was considering pulmonary rehab. He went home. But unfortunately, he was readmitted two days after he was discharged, intubated, and vented for a week. Um, 
so we continued his education, and I continued to meet with him, and he was very much more receptive to smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab. Um, on his follow-up visit to his pulmonary doctor, um, lung transplant was actually mentioned as the only option that would help him, and um, he was told he would never gain weight, he would never feel any better than he did at that point, which was probably the end of December of 2014. So he, uh, along with a lot of our COPD patients, he had um, a high level of anxiety, which it also complicates the smoking cessation, which they use as a stress uh, tool. Um, so it took many phone calls. He canceled several appointments before he finally came in for his pulmonary rehab eval. And he kind of took off from there. He was very receptive to the program. He came in regularly. He didn't like to miss. He really didn't like the cold weather, but he did come in. Um, so between 2014 and 2015, he completed his pulmonary rehab. Uh, he actually told me he went out and bought a, a treadmill off of Craigslist so that if he couldn't get make it in here, he could still do his, his walking. Um, he is now on the maintenance program, which he is paying out of pocket um, himself. He's still on continuous oxygen, but he continues to remain smoke-free. He has gained 30 pounds, contrary, uh, contrary to what he was told would be a reasonable expectation for him. Um, he has had one ER visit and no hospitalizations since uh, his last discharge in November of 2014. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, next patient story over to LaToya. Hi, my name is LaToya Yeomans. I am R with Inspira for six years. I've been a nurse for nine, and I've been in the COACH program for two and a half years. Um, I'm going to speak on a patient that I visited, um, which shows our coordination of care that we do. Um, so I met with this patient who was uh, screened here in the hospital, and she was called on the phone for a home visit. And during our phone call for the home visit, she didn't mention any of her major issues with us. She just basically told us that she couldn't get her pain medicine was her number one thing. And we all know that pain is sometimes, uh, it, uh, it's, no, it's not like, it um, can take over the world's priority. So all she told us was that she needed pain medication. When I went to see this patient, I was visiting her for pneumonia and pneumonia follow-up and education. I arrived and number one, the patient was smoking. Number two, uh, she did not have a PCP, she did not have any of her medications, um, well not any, I'm sorry, let me back up, she did have some of her medications, three, but she should have been on about ten of them. Um, so she did not have those medications, did not tell anyone that she did not have them, could not afford them, and She had recently just moved here from out of town, out of state, actually. She was staying at a campground. Um, so I was able to basically help her facilitate getting her care under control. So the first thing we did was I, she had already applied for Medicaid and had got accepted, but she was still in the waiting um, process. She was actually in the stage where she was supposed to be selecting her HMO. Um, so a couple of the doctors that she was referred and was supposed to see, I helped her call them and see which HMO they would accept under Medicaid, and um, we got the ball rolling there. So I helped her basically select that HMO. I helped her get those um, appointments set up for the two doctors she was supposed to see, and ultimately I helped her find a PCP. The one that she had in mind and I guess had seen years ago was not really willing to see her. So I was able to help her get set up with our Complete Care, which is a local clinic um, that we refer a lot of our patients to who don't have insurance or have fallen on hard times as far as finance. Um, so they were able to facilitate her and help her with her medications as well. Because remember I said that she did not have majority of her medications. Um, she had her insulin and she had her Xarelto, and the Xarelto was getting ready to run out. Um, so she went to see our Complete Care Clinic, 
and they helped her with her medications, get all of her medications. They also gave her referrals to um, two of the doctors that I had referred her to as well. Um, and we did follow up with her again the other day, actually. Now, on the 15th, we talked with her, and she said everything was still going well. She was doing well. She um, had her, still had her referrals for urology, and she was in need still of a vascular surgeon. Apparently, the one that she had and had been given, I guess, from complete care was not accessible of her insurance. So we, again, gave her another um, doctor that should assess her insurance. Um, we continue to do follow-up phone calls, and she knows that she can call us if she needs us for any assistance, and that's pretty much her story. And Terry, I'm sorry, Gail will be speaking about her diabetic patients. Hi, my name is Gail Bracchiao, and I'm a registered nurse. I've been at Inspire for 11 years, but I've been a nurse for 28 years. Um, I've been, I've been uh, part of the coach team since the beginning, just pieces, but I became a full-fledged member of it uh, three years ago. Uh, we are now seeing diabetics, and when we first started seeing the diabetics, I had a patient that I went to her home um, for her first visit, and this is just uh, an example of the things that we do to try to keep the patients out of the hospital. So when I went to her, when I, re when I arrived at her home, she was actually just sitting on the couch. She was lethargic, and she was kind of speaking mumbled. So when I asked her what was wrong, she just said she was tired. So as we were going on with the visit, I realized that she wasn't just tired, that it probably was her sugar, and we did her sugar, and she was under 60. So there was nothing in her home. She had a little bit of juice. So we took her um, blood sugar, I gave her the juice, and then I proceeded to call the physician's office, told the physician what it was, and they said to wait the 15 minutes and to try to get something into her. Well, she had nothing in the home, so while I was waiting for the 15, 20 minutes to go by, there was a little store near the home. So I went to the store, and I bought some food, came back, and I made her a meal. And while she was eating, I was able to get in touch with her daughter, who Apparently, she was supposed to live with the daughter, but she decided that she did not want to live with the daughter. She lived in a senior um, community, and that's where she wanted to be. So I talked to the daughter. The daughter said that she wanted her to come with her, but she had refused. The daughter was in the midst of moving, and when I talked to the patient again, I realized that the reason that she didn't want to live with the daughter is because she felt that she was in the way, that um, there was no room for her. So the daughter talked to her and told her that, you know, there was a room for her. That's why they moved. Called the doctor back, and um, it was just a day of going back and forth from the doctor to the daughter to the patient. And before I left, I was able to get the patient's blood sugar up to normal. Um, we didn't have to do a doctor's visit. We didn't have to do an ER visit. And in the midst of it, we actually got her straightened out that she was going to move back in with the daughter. The daughter would take care of her with the diabetes, make sure that she followed with the doctor, and the daughter would take care of her diet. Also, you know, in doing the education, told her how important it is to have the pack there for when your sugars are low and what to do. So, um, it turned out well. She was not readmitted back to the hospital. She moved in with the daughter. We did our follow-up phone calls, and we have not had her for quite a while. So, Terry's going to talk now um, about med boxes. Hi, I'm Terry Cavanero. Um, I've been a nurse for 28 years. I'm the newest member of the coach team. I was hired in March of 2015. Um, I was formerly a case manager and did UR and discharge planning, so this was not totally new to me, um, making home visits and following patients. Um, my story is about my 90-year-old um, gentleman who I went to see and identified a need for a simple med box. 
and it was a huge production just for him to get a med box. We don't have any access to free medication boxes, um, so I reached out to different um, agencies, places that I knew of to try and get him one, um, and we finally did get some donated from our home care agency, and we now have med boxes. But he, his story, uh, it was very simple. That's all he needed. Um, he finally did, was able to buy one. This was before we were able to obtain free ones. And I was able to go and help him fill his med boxes. I tried to refer him to home care. They um, would not take him because he was not homebound. Um, so he was kind of on his own. Uh, Currently, we're looking to get a grant for med boxes through Cumberland County Office on Aging, uh, the Medical Management Program Title III D, and we're waiting for that to become available so we can apply for that and get med boxes so we can um, use them when we need them. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is Pat Heslop again. I just wanted to share some of the other areas of community connection that we have. We do give our patients a small amount of food from time to time if the need is identified. And we're able to do that by collaborating with our local food bank. Um, we do pay a very small fee for these food boxes, but at the same time, we also do food drive um, so that um, we have enough food for our patients. We collaborate also with our community clinic. We have a complete care clinic here for patients who are not able to provide um, medical care for themselves or have no insurance. We um, work with the uh, private physician practices. Some of these physicians have um, PCCs, um, we have population health service now with some of our own physicians, ING. They also have PCC, which is um, the population care coordinators. And um, of course, we'll be working on doing our home visits with the help of the paramedics from our sister hospital in, Wood in Woodbury. We also partnered with the Extended care facilities, subacute, home care agency, and we have a committee that is called the Extended Care Collaborative, and we meet once a month to discuss our transition of care processes to assist us in, um, in preventing readmission. And um, for the past Three years we've been providing our patients in the community with Thanksgiving meals um, from our life program and um, also our former patients. And we've also been able to work with patients and identify those who are sometimes in need of want to make a decision on whether or not to use the finances that they have to provide themselves with food or medication, whichever comes first. So we've really built a good relationship with some of our patients. Um, I just wanted to do a quick overview of where we are with some of our data. We are not really big on data. We have a, a MBA or a specialist who does that for SEMA management group. And this is an overview of our coach data for since its inception in 2010 to the first quarter of 2015. Based on our numbers, we have managed to make an improvement in our readmission data by 42%. Just our coach program, meaning the patients that were actually enrolled in the, pay, in the program. Those that were enrolled, we have a readmission rate of 19.2% versus the ones that were not enrolled, there's a readmission rate of 33.5%. We do have patients who refuse 
or offer of um, enrollment in this program, as this program is really a voluntary program. And those patients that refuse, their data show that the readmission rate there is 23.5%, and that is just for the year 2013 to 2014. Um, we have a few items on some lessons learned, and Sharon will be um, discussing some of these with you. Sharon? In um, the things that you learn at the bedside continue to evolve once you start um, making home visits and have repeat calls and follow-ups, and certain, certain things um, continue to come to light and we continue to work to resolve them, so we kind of got together a few of the ones that we've come across in doing the follow-ups and, and work to find solutions to them because they don't seem to be isolated incidents. Um, we, we found that patients that were being discharged, veterans that were being discharged, their, their primary care physicians were the VA. And while all of their uh, medications and DME equipment are covered, there's a delay from when they were discharged to when they actually got in to see the physicians and have those things put in process. And so rather than, um, I had one patient, his, his meds would have cost him $450, and he would have been eventually reimbursed for that amount, but he couldn't wait the two weeks to be out that much money, so he never filled his scripts and ended up back in the hospital. So um, we got together, we, reached, uh, we spoke with our director, Lynette, she reached out to um, local political figures, the VA, and they came up with a plan that now the Veterans Administration will um, approve a temporary bridging order to get the patient meds or if they need oxygen or BiPAP or equipment so that, you know, until they get it approved through whatever their process is. Um, it's still evolving, we're still working on it, but um, the patients are getting their meds at discharge now instead of waiting until they make their VA appointment. Um, some, on, on a respiratory note, we, I had several patients that were discharged with nebula, uh, nebulizer machines but did not have the medications put in it because as the scripts were written, um, they weren't written by pulmonary doctors, they were written by um, hospitalists or uh, possibly even the residents who weren't quite sure what included a complete script, and they thought that by writing nebulizer that included the medication. So we're working to get to make it more um, well known that the medication actually has to be included on the script as well as the equipment. Um, we're starting to um, all of the coaches are we're working to assess our patient uh, the high risk patients that that I obviously don't go into the home. I do all my follow up. Um, education by phone, so um, the nurses actually go out if there is a high-risk patient, but it's a large, large volume of patients, and now we're starting to have the paramedics go out, and uh, that's proving to be very beneficial to the patients. For us, we get some feedback from the paramedics about the home situation, so, um, and they actually go out more often. They're going once a week for four weeks. Um, the goal of... Uh, you know, it's, it, the goal of the program, I guess, is to prevent readmissions, but also to get the patients more engaged in um, the day-to-day -day management, you know, why they're taking medications and, you know, what they're for and making sure they take the right amount. And it's, it's an ongoing battle, but um, getting them more involved, they, they seem to want to participate more because they can actually understand what's going on through all the ac extra education. Um, part of the... Uh, Treatment, the accepted treatment and recommended um, therapy for um, COPD patients once they are discharged and cardiac and, and the CHF and the MI patients is to get into outpatient pulmonary and cardiac rehab. And um, our numbers in those patients that are participating has drastically gone up. And we do find, and we are tracking that, um, they, they tend to be, uh, have a much lower readmission rate if they're actively attending rehab. Um, there's a decrease in the patients that are refusing coach, I think, just because there's more education being done bedside and they're uh, receptive to the paramedics coming out. Um, and I think I've heard from many patients, and I'm sure the other nurses have heard the same thing, that being able to call and get in touch with someone to have a question answered in real time is very beneficial. They're not, uh, they don't have to wait to get through to the doctor's office sometimes if it's just a simple question about a medication or they need a refill, we can facilitate that, help them get uh, doctor's appointments moved up if they seem to be 
you know, not feeling well or looking like they're on a track to come back to the hospital, you know, we've, we've all made calls to the physician offices and had them scheduled quickly and seen quickly. Okay, so um, we've come to the end of our section of the program. Thank you for listening, and now we're open to questions that you might have. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate all of your time for presenting this. We have had quite a few questions coming through. I want to encourage those of you that have questions that have not submitted to please enter them under the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will get to as many as we can. So the questions, and those, some of you have uh, submitted questions in other directions, so we'll start with a couple of those. And for those of you on the phone line, we will try to open up the lines, but we want to get through as many as possible. So the first question is, um, you've, you've mentioned the home health agency in the sense of the, some of these patients don't qualify for home health because of their lack of homebound status. Where does home health fit into your model for the patients who do qualify? Home care. I'm sorry. Yeah, home care. Um, home care is uh, added bonus for those patients. Our visit consists of one visit and um, phone calls, except for the heart failure patient gets two visits in a month. Home care agency visits the patient more often. We have most of the patients that we have on our program with home care. We like to believe that our um, collaboration with the agency will allow them to discuss the care and to share with us if they have concerns. We let them know that we're going into their homes. Um, and they are aware of our program. But home care is above and beyond what we do. Okay, and so you have, um, do you work with the agencies in your community or is it your hospital-based agency? We have several agencies. We have a hospital-based agency and we have other agencies in the community. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question in the box that is talking about the funding issues, and I'm going to read it to you because I want to make sure that we establish, I think these are similar answers or similar covered together. Under what reimbursement model are you servicing your patients in this program? And also, um, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, we're not reimbursed for this program. This program is part of our discharge um, planning process. It's, um, it's a free program that's offered to our patients as transition of care. Um, we identified the need for such a patient program, and as I mentioned before, because of the CMS um, readmission um, reduction program, we found that it was beneficial to us to have such a program because it allowed us to avoid penalties um, on some, some occasions. Well, your results are, they speak for themselves, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question is, I have been trying to initiate something like this with my hospital for COPD patients. With our existing home health RNs doing the visit, payment seems to stand in the way. How did you deal with this initially? How did you approach your hospital to pay for this program with no results to back it up initially? Well, we were somewhat pro, pro, I guess, proactive in 2010, and we wrote, we went, um, the administrative director and myself went to several seminars related to readmission because we know that in 2012 CMS had plans to do, to implement the penalty program, so we wanted to be proactive. So we attended several seminars, and we saw the results of some of the evidence-based programs out there like the Boost and the RED program. So on our return, we proposed to senior management. Uh, we first presented it to our, our chief nurse executive, and she was very excited about it. And we then presented it to our senior management, which included our chief financial officer and um, CMO and so forth. 
and they were willing to have um, a pilot implemented. We did a pilot, and that pilot was successful, and um, we expanded the program from there. And our first, the first year for the CMS um, readmission reduction penalty, our Vineland campus did not receive a penalty. And we were looking at that time at heart failure, pneumonia, MI. COPD was not included yet. So when COPD was included into CMS penalty, we went to the next level. And um, um, the administrative director made another proposal to our senior management um, to have a respiratory therapist in place. Another qu thank you for that. I'm just getting through as many of these questions as we can because you guys are really doing a great job. So another question is, are the patients able to access this program if they already have home health? Do you see a patient in addition to the home health if they already have that, pay, uh, that service? Yes. Yes, they are also, um, this is above and beyond home health. Um, they are able to enroll in the program. It's unrelated, and we try to explain to the patient when we enter the home, and we also um, make contact with the home health agency to let them know we're going there. When we first started the program, this information was shared with all the local home, home care agencies, the extended care facilities, subacutes, and so on. So they are aware of the program, and um, when we actually visit the patient's home, we would leave our card or so on, or even make contact with the home care nurse if the patient has home care, just to discuss the patient's care, to be sure that um, we're on the same um, page. And I think that's one of the things that all of us that practice in home care and really any type of uh, health care settings is that there does seem to be an abundance of information going to the patient, and even though we want the patient to be in the center of the care, it does tend to get diluted and convoluted, if you will, and so it's good that you have those. Um, that's one of the key pieces of helping the patients remain in the community, whether it's home health or the coaching program, is to keep the uh, lines of communication and everybody on the same page, so kudos for you. We uh, also have a collaborative, we also have a collaborative where um, most of our home care agency and extended care facility are members of that collaborative. So there is an opportunity for us to discuss, you know, our programs that are available and how we can work together, you know, to give the patient the best care there is. And they have an opportunity to ask questions and to voice their concerns and so forth at this collaborative. Yeah, that's wonderful, and that's something that New Jersey exceeds in all areas of New Jersey that we've had contact with. Um, moving on, the next question, there's two of them actually dealing with paramedics, and one is, um, what was the rationale for including paramedics instead of maybe a referral to home health versus skilled care? And then also, um, the funding for paramedic visits, is, is that any different than the regular coaching team? Um, I, I, some of those, those questions I think I'll have to maybe refer to my director because I am not um, up on all the, um, the funding for paramedics. Um, oh, sure. I do That's know cool. that we have certain patients that um, we are reluctant to have the nurses visit and it's, it's more appropriate for, par for the paramedics to do so. And it's to do with distance also. Paramedics are able to um, go to other counties. We started off before we were such a large organization. We now have three hospitals in several different counties. So we're covering a larger area now. Um, instead of just Cumberland and Gloucester County in Salem. Um, so the paramedics do, you know, help us to get to some of those areas. Plus uh, paramedics, the grant program that the Woodbury campus had included uh, a paramedics part of that program. They have a Robert Wood Johnson, I think, grant program which included paramedics doing home visits. 
So that's just an extension of what they were doing. We're just trying to, to merge our programs so they're similar for the system. Um, well, thank you for that. And we have one time for maybe one more question. And this is a good, this is a really good question. All the questions have been good, but this is one I'm interested in too as far as in reducing hospitalization, what are your top two processes that you put into place that you would say helped reduce rehospitalization in both regular home care and also in the population health program, the wellness visits? Um, I guess I would say the coach program is one, and we did have home monitoring um, some time ago. As far as population health, I would have to refer that to the population health team. I cannot speak to that um, particular process. I don't know right now what would be their top program. But for us, I would say um, our coach program. I'm looking to the ladies here to see if you have anything else to uh, to add as far as our top project or initiative that we have in place that would help us with the reducing readmissions. We also have a palliative care. We 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 have also implemented a. I guess a palliative care team, I guess, who would um, assist us with identifying those patients that are end stage. And the interventions for those patients probably would be a little bit different um, and would factor into assisting us with um, readmission. Um, and as I say, I believe this collaboration with the extended care facilities and our um, our team that we have assist us with re helping us to reduce readmission. We're also going to join with the population care coordinators when we, uh, on the patients that are our hospitals patients, our hospital doctors patients, we'll be collaborating with them, which we really don't do now, but we're going to do that in the future. So it'll tie them from here to home to physicians' offices. Right. Another thing that we're working on is making a, we're doing a real push for appointments, making sure that follow-up appointments are made in a timely manner, even working with our complete care clinic to have appointments made before the patient even leaves the hospital. And we're trying to work on a, we were, we had started a pilot for our in-house staff to make appointments for those that don't fall in the clinic population. We try to make appointments um, within the, the seven days of discharge, especially for heart failure patients. Try for all patients, but that is key, one of the guidelines, the recommendation in preventing readmission. Well, I want to thank you for your comments, and I'm going to echo Rebecca's comment. It says, thank you for the work that you do. It's a fantastic program and outcomes. We would like to thank you for taking the time today to share with us not only how the coaching program has come about, but also how it has evolved in the community and enhanced the patient's outcomes. We in home health really have, um, there are many different interventions and actions that play into this, but I think we can all take away from this bits and pieces that can enhance each agency's interventions with the patient. So I wanna thank you for sharing this um, your experience as well as your knowledge. So before we close, we want to just uh, a few updates here for the Cardio Land Group. Just to let remind you, the new quarterly schedule on the Cardio Land is on the screen. Remember that you can mark these on your calendar. Uh, there are ca Outlook calendar invites. You can go onto the website right now and click them. It's always the third Thursday, so this is for December. We'll remind you that in January, this is a really good one for Cardio Land. It's actually the underserved population on January 21st from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. It's called Improving Care Transitions in the Rural Setting. This will contain, we'll have presenters from 
the Minnesota International Heart Institute, you know that's cardiac, the Rural Institute, University of Minnesota, and also a presenter from St. Patrick Hospital. Excuse me, these are Montana, I'm saying Minnesota, that's my typo. So we want to encourage you on January 21st, the third Thursday of January, to join us for that. February will be live chat. If you've not participated in one of these before, we want to encourage you to do so. The live chat is actually you guys lead it. Uh, we're there as HHQI to help if there's anything we can do, but primarily it is uh, the home health agencies just chatting with each other about all different topics. You have to be a speed reader, and it's a fast hour. It's actually one of our favorite hours of the month here at HHQI. It's, we enjoy it. It's a blast. That brings us around to March 17th. The third Thursday of March will be our next Cardio Land. I encourage you to mark your calendars because in this one, we will have national presenters who are physical therapists. They're going to be addressing patients with heart failure and how to maximize each discipline for positive patient outcomes. Don't forget to register for it now if you're interested in it. Save the date, and that way it will be on your calendar. So before we close, we do want to just note that it is the season. So as you're rushing around in the coming weeks, making sure that you have everything ready for your own celebration, focusing on family and friends and coworkers, we as always want to encourage you to maybe spend an extra one or two minutes with your patients and their families because you know they really enjoy spending time with you. So from all of us at HHQI, to all of you, we wish you peace. We'll see you next year. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you.